Section twenty six of the Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two Envoy. On New Year's Day, I heard Mass in Aix la Chapelle, Aachen, over the tomb of Charmaine, Joseph Leopold's hero. But as a matter of fact, we were staying in Belgium within a motor ride a walk or stroll of germany and it seemed oddly enough as if germany the country which like sir james barry's sweet scotch heroine boasts no charm still contrived to draw us we could not keep away from it and i had a strong desire to savourer the sensation of actually crossing a frontier on my two legs to cross a frontier in a train, when it's done it scores of times, can give no particular thrill. The great station at Herberstar is like any other station, except that the station master looks like a gentlemanly chasseur, and the evidence of its international character consists in the tiresome business of having one's luggage examined no the thrill lies in doing it on foot then one can picture vedettes and soldiers of both sides good decent fellows who have no desire to be at each other's throats fraternizing over their drinks standing as they exchange amenities with a leg on each side of the imaginary line of demarcation I am told they actually did this during the Franco-Prussian War. I don't know how they behaved in Belgium, that poor little buffer state guaranteed immune by all the powers and perfectly safe to be constituted the lists for this combat when it does come. France is ready. France is belligerent. The posters are up as I write and that autumn we rolled along the smooth dull roads towards germany the two delightful g dashes belgians joseph leopold and i a fair spadoise and two samples of those charming people who are of no nation but who inhabit belgium warlike images were constantly in our minds for it was the year of the first war scare Everybody, for every sort of reason, was so very anxious that the Pax Britannica, the Pax Germanica, and all possible Paxes should be preserved. And to Joseph Leopold, the German who really knew, all sorts of little curious searching questions were addressed. And out of the serene depths of his German consciousness, Joseph Leopold assured us, There will be no war. But as we passed and approached the frontier, I shed my wrappings and stood up in the car now and then to look at and consider certain strange geographical features before me that reminded me of English North Country slag heaps ending in an overturned wheelbarrow. This gave the usual wild air of unfinishedness and was aided by the truncated rails that lay along the top of the long low earthwork and were cut off sharply too what are those i said german railway lines said joseph leopold but why are they left like that unfinished they can't carry them any further than the frontier as yet but they are ready the sinister significance of his speech smote the whole earful of aliens. The courteous Belgians were silent. I confess that from that moment the possibilities of war became more real to me, and I remembered what had happened the month before. Germany had called in all her gold, and in the town where I was staying, Trier, a frontier town, there was not an ounce of it to be had. I remembered the sudden sound of a rubber dub that used to come up out of the valleys to us strolling on the heights. 
I remembered the conversations that I used to hear in drawing rooms, the sly talk of the reserves. Would they be allowed to go home? The terror of the socialist menace that this scare neutralised, and the congratulations on the victory of the government. It passed off, then. Herr Kittelenwachter's diplomacy was successful, and the little recruits crowded the great stations of France and Germany in their thousands. I myself had watched them that year in Paris, coming in late by the Gare de l'Est. I stood with the wives and mothers on trucks and carts in the entry to that outlandish station, and with difficulty picked out my own man, who happened to be travelling on that line, from the hordes disgorged by the last train. This was real, then, a veritable menace. The frontier at once assumed terrific proportions in my mind. All this innocent, dull and smiling country seemed to my eyes now covered with men marching, men detrained from those truncated conductors of ruin and strife, placed there like blunted ends of swords, yet terribly significant, thus far and no farther, as yet. We were bowling along on open heath-fringed roads, up ascents, down declivities of low heath-covered hills, blue on the horizon that was Germany. It all looked alike. But I felt the sense of imminence so strongly that I almost jumped, as Joseph Leopold said composedly, Germany down there, just before we begin to go up again. You will see the squashed crow in a minute. In the turn of the valley there was an ordinary tiled cottage, set bare and gardenless on the side of the ascending road. The eagle of Prussia was spread in the usual spatch-cocked way on an unpretending signboard beside it. The douane. Had we anything to declare? We had descended. The chauffeur shook his head. Some paper was given us by the burly Prussian officer who sat behind a grill inside this cottage on the heathery waste, and who came out politely to see what we were like, then mutely passed us on. We were free of Germany. The country looked just the same, the villages too. German characteristics did not appear so early. But a few miles farther on, the familiar rows of grey pots appeared, hat-like, stuck on the gate-posts. And then some geese, more geese, and a whitewashed house with broad blue-painted rafters. I was at home. The rub dub too. Military manoeuvres were being carried on somewhere not very far off, on the broad park-like plateau we had now attained. The place we were bound to, Montjoie, so the Schwadois lady frequently told us, was supposed to be a gem of a town, lying very low in a kind of castle, but possessing a fine old castle, which was throned on the rock, high above the town. We should see a curiously and wildly picturesque place, the physical features contributing, and all in a ridiculously small compass. Also, it was, according to another member of our party, Mr. C., a very happy hunting ground for old furniture. And we ascended hills and descended mountain gorges, like those in the Ardenne country, clothed with heavy pines and firs, luxuriant and well watered. And by and by, we came to Montjoie. It was perched on a set of granite cliffs, whose height equalled the hills we had descended to get down into the valley. The river wound stilly, smugly in among the cliffs. The houses of the little town, creeping about on its banks, were entirely dominated by the castled steep and hidden 
until the road wandering among the gorges of the cliff led us into the kernel of the valley where it lies i have seldom seen a more spectacular place and as we penetrated farther i could not help thinking of the last chromolithograph i had seen of some impossible piece of place portraiture prepared for the outside of a chocolate box down these sheer steeps from the ruined chocolate box castle as on the back sheet of the stage of my first pantomime i could have imagined that i saw fairies slung in paper festoons come sliding glissading down to pantaloon in front of the stage fluffing out their skirts and beginning their pointed toed dance for here there are bridges over the foaming stream and stage houses with balconies hanging over the torrent every sort of papier mache effect crowded into a small space the great shale cliffs of an inky blackness overhang the little streets lying in the shadow sunless as victoria street at noonday but shot through by shafts of sunlight from above small fir trees planted all along both sides of the street lining them with green as it were a box for packing fruit or sweets brushed at the wheels of our car and added to the strange stagey effect it was an accidental one and only for the day we were here these trees were staged not planted for the kaiser had just visited montjoie the yellow paper roses that festooned the pink house of a commerzion rat s had not yet faded after their manner for it had not rained since a very tall magnificent house was that of herr s with ogival windows and a double perron and a fine renaissance door inside there was a set of beautiful furniture which we were permitted to see as herr s had gone away at once after the auspicious visit as a matter of fact he always permitted his concierge to make an honest penny by showing his possessions and his house was only the ordinary plain house of a german gentleman of rank and family très digne très comfortable full of objects which to him were family heirlooms then we all lunched at the hotel and drank healths all round in good cheapish rhine wine the healths of several nationalities for belgian english german and french all these nationalities were represented about the table in the little saal the ceiling after the good old german fashion was stuck full of corks that had been precipitated from bottles of mine host's honest cellar the hotel was an old mansion and the stairs were worth seeing carved oldish fairly good Mouchoir is like a freak of germany queer wonderful and uncanny yes it reminded me of a conte d'offman and it came wonderfully on a picture postcard we bought some and some old furniture to please the spadois lady who had brought us and then we motored back into belgium for the time End of section 26. End of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt, with preface and additional chapters by Ford Maddox Heffer, Ford Maddox Ford.